What's up everyone, Acid Glow here with an update to some more details about the upcoming Predator movie called Prey. The previous video I did covered a lot of information about how Prey was conceived over the past few years. It's a long video, but it covers many topics like the Comanche dub version of the movie, how Disney did not affect the rating of the movie at all, some new gadgets and weapons, how the actor was chosen to play the role of the Predator, how this new Predator is a new breed, Yes, it's different, but similar in a way, along with more articles taken from interviews about the cast and script. So if you want to dive deep into how the movie was created, then check out that video. It is pretty long, but it gives you a lot of backstory from the director and producers. All right, so this new video has more information taken from sources like Twitter and another interview. Now let's get to the point of each section. First thing, the actor who is playing the Predator in this movie is Dane DiLiegro. According to his Twitter feed, he says this is the Feral Predator. That's actually a pretty unique name. It kind of makes it sound more brutal or savage with just the name alone. So what do you think? Do you like Feral Predator? Tell me in the comments section. The next section is from an article posted on the website EmpireOnline.com. Dan Trackenberg recalls the time he first encountered the story of the Predator. This dates back to the original movie a long time ago, and like many of us, this occurred at a very young age. He says this, Predator came out when I was in third grade. I was not allowed to see it, and rightfully so, but I was in the van on the way to a karate tournament with a bunch of sixth graders, and they described the entire movie to me, including a beat where Billy, the Native American scout, played by Sonny Landham, carved into his own chest and fought the Predator on a waterfall. And then I saw the movie, and that scene is not really in it. But that always captured my imagination. I always wanted to see that movie, you know? And that is also a part of the genesis of this. Another topic is about how the Native American hunters were the ideal center point to the Predator. It's something that Dan had in mind from the start. Here's what he says. That was my initial pitch to Fox before it was purchased by Disney. The notion of how cool it would be to make a movie that focuses on a Native American story. To make a western that has no cowboys in it. That's a movie which really does not exist. It shockingly doesn't. And I just wanted to make a movie that would be told primarily, visually, and through action. This led to a big challenge for the filmmaker. How do you engage in a very economical way and still tell an emotional story. I'm not an athlete in any way. I do not follow sports, but I love sports movies, primarily because they feel like action movies that you don't need laser guns for, but they always feel warm and hopeful, you know? And so I thought, if I could have the engine of a sports movie tell a real underdog story inside this action movie, it could feel really gripping and moving. Part and parcel with that underdog story was what if we make it about someone and a people that also, in media, are the underdog? Who are the people that never have a light shined on them? Amber Midthunder, who plays the role of Naru, has been seen in shows like Legion and movies including The Ice Road and Hell or High Water. Dan explains how she got the role for this film. He says this about her. Primarily because she's awesome. She read for the role in a hotel room over Zoom or FaceTime and she really delivered. She transported me immediately, despite the strange circumstances of her audition tape. She's incredibly thoughtful and relatable. One of the things that I was excited to have was a period piece that didn't put a wall up between the viewer and the characters, and not stuffy in a way that sometimes a period piece can get, because it's of a different time, you forget that people are still people, and still felt the same feelings that we feel today, even way back then and Amber immediately has that laser into our soul of, oh man, she feels how I feel. Also, her parents have both been stunt performers in the past and I thought, if they can do it, she can do it too. And boy, did she. She trained so hard for this movie and really delivers on the action. Dan mentioned that there are more than just Native Americans in this movie. While he didn't go too deep into this topic, he does say this, I don't want to speak too much of this, I want to make sure that I let the movie speak for itself, but yes, those are French fur trappers, right? And they do play a significant role in the movie. This could be linked to the scene where Naru walks into an open field and sees the bodies of large animals with their fur removed or they look skinned. 
There were various sources that gave inspiration for this film. Terence Malick probably came up the most. And not just The New World, but Days of Heaven and The Thin Red Line also. We referenced images from those movies and cinematography and wanted it to feel authentic. That's very much a part of the soul of this movie. And Macbeth. The Michael Fassbender Macbeth was a big visual influence on the movie. Near the end of the first full trailer, there's a quick scene of Naru hiding in the mud. This seems to be a nod towards a scene from the first movie with Dutch hiding from the Predator. Here's what Dan said about this. There was so many moments where we're almost seduced by putting in more and more easter eggs. Get to the chopper is not in this movie, despite so many people wondering, what if there was a horse named Chopper? We didn't go all the way there, though there are tons of intentional and unintentional nods to the first movie. According to the director, some of these nods were entirely unconscious, born from his sheer love of both suspense and predator. What's funny is, in the trailer, there's a sequence in the tall grass, and I remember going over to one of our actors, Harlan, which is Blaine Kiat Waihat, who plays Itzy in the movie. He's the one who pulls Amber down into the grass, and he has to tell her to be quiet. And I said, I think it wants to feel like you don't freak out. There was a line or something, but I said, just go, shh, just hold up your finger. I watched the take back, turned the cinematographer, and said, this feels familiar, I think. And he goes, yeah, Predator. And I was like, oh yeah, obviously that movie is ingrained in my brain. Here's the part where Dan talks about removing one iconic weapon from the Predator's arsenal, something that will not be in the movie. The primary thing that I wanted to remove was the plasma caster, just because it just felt like such an instant win button. I wanted to make sure that the fight could be as exciting as possible without stripping it of his advantages. He doesn't have all the tools that he has in newer movies, but he does have awesome new gadgets for people to see. Even though Dan is a fan of the other Predator films, he wanted his movie to go back to the feeling that hasn't been truly felt since Dutch and his team encountered the Predator in the Val Verde jungle in 1987. He said this, There's a lot of suspense in the movie. I think that's something that hasn't really been as much a part of the franchise. Certainly, when you think about these films, you think much more about the action and the gore, the horror of it. As a kid, it was very much a horror movie to me. So the movie is, I think, trying to be much scarier than it's ever been and much more suspenseful, for sure. The last topic in this article is how Dan Trackenberg and writer Patrick Eisen look back at all the Predator sequels, and it seems like the sequels never really captured the essence of the first film. I think all of the movies after the first one have all had really cool bits. I don't know if there's ever been one that, on the whole, was just a fabulous movie. I think they've all had varying degrees of awesome parts in them, so it was very important to me that not only does this movie have to have awesome parts in it, but it also really needed to have a great story and something that was more universal even than in the original Predator. I wanted to return to the basic primal instincts of that original Predator movie. I think so many big swings have been taken since that one. And that was a part of this. Okay, let's do small again, but in a big way. And so hopefully, for the die-hard fans of the franchise and all of its incarnations, they feel like this movie is speaking only to them. And for people who have never seen a Predator movie before, they're like, oh, it's a movie? It's a real movie? I thought it was just a monster movie. It's both. Since the plasma caster is not going to be in this movie, perhaps the targeting lasers are meant for another projectile-based weapon. But I don't see it making sense to use it with something that has to be thrown by hand, unless the lasers are going to assist a weapon that is launched by another device. I'm not sure. What do you think? I did mention that the item on his back looks like the handle to a sword, because it looks similar to what Greyback used in the comic books that took place in 1718. I think it's great that they are changing things about the Predator, like the design and weapons it has access to. It keeps things familiar, but new at the same time. So this feral Predator reminds me of an old Honorable Yauchua from the comic book story of Predator Homeworld, where this one uses the more primitive types of weapons. It has no wrist gauntlet or body armor. It also seems to share a similar design with the feral Predator, in terms of the mandibles that is. 
they are aligned in a more vertical way, which is different from the other predators we've seen before. There was another group of predators in that story. These three were ruthless killers with no honor, but they had some body armor and limited technology like invisibility and a plasma caster. I think some inspiration was taken from this comic book along with another one called Predator Hunters, where a ship carrying a hunting party was damaged and it sunk in the ocean, leaving the predators stranded on an island. All of their advanced technology went down with their ship. Their weapons, masks, and body armor were then made of wood that they found on the island. This story also led to a primitive type of character that was seen in the video game Predator Hunting Grounds. It was called the Tiki Predator. And for those of you wondering if this predator is female, that would be a cool idea, but I don't think it's going to happen. During these interviews, Dan has referred to the feral predator as him, his, and even saying it's a guy. When there are more updates about the film or if there's any new topics of interest, I shall make a new video. Make sure you subscribe to my channel to see more videos like this. My name is Carlos or Acid Glow. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next time.